Hi, and welcome to episode number 148 of the weekly Google Cloud Platform podcast. I'm Mark Randall, and I'm here with my colleague Melanie Warwick yet again after a short hiatus. How are you doing, Melanie? Hi, Mark. Welcome back. Uh, welcome back to you, too. Uh, I think we've both been traveling a whole lot. Yes, we were. And I know last week you were a little tied up over in Tokyo. Where were you in Tokyo? What were you up to? So yeah, I was over in Tokyo. I was at Cloud Next presenting at the inside version of Cloud Next. So the game conference that was like a little side thing on Cloud Next. It was a pretty awesome event. It was really great. I think there were thousands of people, lots of cloud people from Cloud Tokyo. And I also learned something very important. I didn't realize this, but their local uh, GCP community is called uh, CF Pug. So GCP user group. And they have a logo with a pug inside the hexagon and it's a pug. It's awesome. So that's a group I need to be involved in. Yes. I have a sticker on my laptop now. Uh, nice. Well, so overall it was a great experience, it sounds like. And I'm glad yeah, you fantastic. I'm glad you've made it back. <laughs> I was in Daba. Yeah, I was gonna say last week we were sharing the episode we recorded in Stellenbosch, uh, Africa, which was at Deep Learning Adaba and it was great. And one thing I forgot to mention last week was that one of the awards that was given out for the best posters was Google Cloud Platform Credits. We gave out $1,000 worth of credits for 25 different posters. So it was really great. And I'm glad we were able to do the podcast and record from there. We have a couple more podcasts that we'll be sharing out later next month. And thank you to you, Melanie, for taking care of the podcast while I was in Japan. I really appreciate it. It was fun. If for anybody who wants to know the difference between a South African accent and an Australian accent, you should listen to last week's episode. <laughs> episode and then all the other episodes and <laughs> that you can compare right. <laughs> anyways because we had a, we had some help from a few folks over there so mark what's going on this week so this week we're bringing back a interview that we did while we were at next earlier this year so the next in san francisco this time we had a great discussion with the team from wellio with sivan and eric talking about all the data science things they do over at wellio it was really really cool it was it was a full picture it was, it was the nice thing it's seeing like applied machine learning but from the start to the end from coming up with the concept and the problem and then actually to the deployment it was really a valuable interview and so i'm glad we're finally going to get a chance to share that with everyone one. Yeah, yeah, a really great one. And then we have a question of the week this afternoon. We're going to step away from the GCP side of things and move back maybe a little to the Google Cloud. So we did hear that Inbox is going away, which makes me very sad. But we're going to talk about what can we do with the Gmail features that have been moved across and talk a little bit about that and like what sort of things you can use once Inbox is gone. Yes, how to move forward with Gmail and as the inbox goes away. We're going to have a therapy session. It's, it's all good. All right. So as always, we start off with our cool things of the week. We have a couple things that are generally available now. Mm. Data Studio and Data Prep. So Data Studio being this great BI tool that we've been providing. It's working with more than 500 data sources and more than 100 partner-built connectors. And it's used by over a million people. It's, it's a pretty well-used tool that's out there in terms of uh, business intelligence. And Data Prep, of course, allowing you to prepare your data when you're doing any type of analysis or machine learning with it. There's a lot of work sometimes you have to do to clean it up and the data prep tool allows you to do that. And now that it's generally available, it's got a new look. It allows for things like team collaboration and some additional features. So yeah, those are nice. That is nice. Yeah. And speaking of generally available, we also have cloud memory store for Redis going generally available. So if you're looking for a managed Redis system, you can come to us for that as well. And we also expanded it to several new regions. So now cloud memory store is supported in Tokyo, Singapore, and Netherlands, which are new, as well as Oregon, Iowa, South Carolina, Belgium, and Taiwan. Nice. Another cool thing of the week, um, I know earlier this year in May, we were talking about the Coursera courses that came out for TensorFlow. And these were the machine learning with TensorFlow on Google Cloud Platform course. That's a five course specialization. And it's like now in the top 10 data science specializations on Coursera that's out there. Following on to that, they went with a more advanced machine learning with TensorFlow course that has been released recently. And this advanced course covers topics like end-to-end -end machine learning with TensorFlow on Google Cloud Platform, production machine learning systems, 
image understanding with TensorFlow and Google Cloud, sequence models for time series and natural language processing, and recommendation systems with TensorFlow. So this is something that will help take you another step down the path of expanding your machine learning expertise. And there's going to be a webinar on October 9th at 9 a.m. to learn more about the course. Fantastic. Speaking of machine learning as well, teammates of ours, uh, Sarah Robinson and Zach Ackill, recently released a blog post on the Google Cloud blog called Simplifying ML Predictions with Google Cloud Functions. This is a really great hands-on blog post that takes you through all the code that they use to write cloud functions, calling cloud ML from the cloud function, and going all the way through. It's actually a really great read. Yes, it is. And it's great to get this out from our teammates. Yes. And the last thing we want to mention is that Mark Moore gave us a shout out as one of the 50 best cloud security podcasts um, in an article that he wrote. And he gave us a nice little overview in terms of some of the podcast episodes in particular that he found especially useful. And one of those, of course, being the Vent Surf episode, which I agree was a very valuable episode that you guys captured last year. Thank you very much for including us in your list. It was much appreciated. Thank you. All right, Mark, I think it's time for us to go and talk with Wellio. Yeah, I think we did enough cool things of the week. Let's go talk with Wellio. Yes. So it's day three here at Next, and it's the final interview, but super excited. We have two wonderful people with us. I'm going to probably massacre your names, but we'll try our very best. Uh, Sivan Aldo Neumann. Yes. Oh, wonderful VP of Data Science at Wellio, and Eric Adrenko. Yes. Oh, oh my God, I'm doing really well. You're amazing. Also CTO of Wellio. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and taking time out of Next to come hang out with us. Yes, yeah, that's our pleasure. Us. Yeah. Awesome. Um, we want to hear all about what you're doing at Wellio, how you do it, like all, how all the stuff works, basically. Uh, but do you want to tell us a little bit about who both of you are and what it is you do? Sivan, you want to go first? Sure. So my name is Sivan, and it's a nice Israeli name, Hebrew name, Hebrew month. <laughs> my background's in statistics, so I have a master and a PhD in the, the statistics world. And I was kind of intrigued in applying statistics to temporal spatial models. So that's where I started my career. And I worked for several years in the agriculture technology space, alongside Eric, actually. And after several years there, I transitioned to Wellio. And in Wellio, we work on the food technology space, which is kind of in a similar space, right? They're related to each other, but one tackles more the demand side and the other the supply side. So after several years in the supply side of food, I really wanted to move to the demand because if you want to change supply, you really should just change demand. That's much easier. So I joined Wellio and I've been developing models for and recommendation systems for food. And I think we'll tell you a little bit more about Wellio in a minute. Um, but yeah, I build models for life. I am a super duper happy statistician, data scientist slash machine learner and all the words above that describe the same position. And you like chocolate. And I love Dark chocolate, correct. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, and I'm uh, Eric. I'm a CTO and co-founder of Wellio. My background is very similar to Savan's. In, in some ways, I'm I'm trained as a computer scientist. I did a PhD actually in uh, pure math. I think of myself as a disillusioned mathematician. I got a little tired of staring at the wall and wanted to do something a little more impactful. So I came out to the Bay Area and I've been working in machine learning ever since. And Wellio kind of grew out of a, a personal problem that I had that I think is shared by many people, which is to feed my family at home healthy meals and make good decisions about food in ways that make eating at home the, the easiest and healthiest choice. And especially when making decisions under duress, like with a crying kid and, and hungry, that's exactly the moment when I want machines to make decisions for me because I know I won't make a good one. And I had all this exposure to technology that was helping make nutrition decisions for plants, but I had none of that technology for my own family. And so I wanted to create the experience of having a personal chef and a nutritionist in the house to, to help with meal planning and grocery shopping and those sorts of things. And I imagined a, a, a way in which that could be embodied in an intelligent machine. And so that's, that's kind of how, how we got to here. When we talk about Wellio, we talk about how can we make a personalized family nutritionist available to everyone in the world, not just someone that can afford it. We both have families. I have two kids. So we, we've tackled the problem of like, how do you feed everyone in the family? How do you personalize it? I'm on a diet. My husband likes these kind of foods. My kids don't eat these types of foods. So how do we really cook at home so that everyone's happy, everyone's healthy? And also like the other side is how do we make people learn the relationship between food and their well-being, which is 
very hard. It's very hard to know, and you look at trends of how people have thought about diets over time. It, it's it changes, right? One decade, it's you need more vitamin C. In the next decade, it's vitamin D, and like, oh, eat more meat, eat less meat. There's not a lot of consistent science in this domain, and definitely not very hard to personalize that domain. And that's sort of the the problem we're trying to tackle. Well, how does Wellio work? That's a very good question. So there's two things to Wellio. There's the technology platform, which is really ultimately designed to be an, an AI for food, if you excuse the buzzwords for this technical audience. Yeah. What, is the, what does the user experience look like? Yeah. And so on top of that user experience, one uh, user experience we are testing in the market today is uh, it's essentially a virtual culinary assistant. So you say something like, I would like to eat shrimp tacos tonight, and then it knows, oh, you probably want corn tortillas because there's someone in the house who's gluten-free. You like these brands. You need this number of servings. You'll probably like this recipe, but it needs to be modified a little bit to make it spicy, less spicy, reduce the fat content, increase the protein content, something like that. And the system goes out, translates that high-level request into a specific grocery order. It executes the grocery order for you. And then through one of our partners, we deliver a bag of groceries and customized uh, recipes to you the same day. So so it translates a high-level intent into dinner tonight. And what markets do you serve? Right now, we're not publicly available, although you can sign up for our beta list. And we can currently serve about 60% of the U.S. market. Um, we're mostly limited on availability of a delivery partner. And we, we partner with Amazon Fresh, Instacart, people, people like that to actually do the uh, last mile uh, delivery. Nice. Well, so in terms of data science. How does data science play a role into this? So from minute zero, data and data science played a really big role. So I think you can imagine you can build this company two ways. One is you can start with very limited meals, bring an expert in the domain, like a, a chef, and start creating very tiny little recipes and start promoting those recipes. And over time, you would increase your database and make it bigger and, and learn intent and, and so on and so on. We did not go that path. We didn't feel that's a scalable path. And really, from the get-go, we said, we really want to understand the culinary space and the food space. And in order to do that from, like, as a data scientist, what you first need is a big data set. And so we went out and got a, a vast amount of data, recipe data, for example, and blog data on food and articles on food. And we generated a gigantic database with food-related information. And then we could start training models on top of it. And when Eric says, like, translate intent to a shopping list and doing all of that, there's a lot of models that come into play from, you know, taking this unstructured data, whether it's the intent or even if you think about the data that we've accumulated, like if you look at recipe data from different varieties and you really think about, you know, not a single website, but many, many websites, it's unstructured data. So the first thing you have to do is apply some way to structure it. And we took a very machine learning, deep learning approaches, and we structure it using models. Mm. And once the data is structured, then you can start building recommendation systems on top of them that would recommend what recipe, how to adapt the recipe, personalize it to, to a certain person or a family, even like how to make it into a shopping list. So now that you have a recipe, how do you personalize the shopping list? Maybe it's particular stores that people like or brands or particular items that they prefer, organic, for example, or traditional. So so all these personalization on top is another part where the machine learning and a data science comes in. Wait, and where does your data come from? The data is uh, comes from proprietary sources and also from the web. Got it. So it's a combo. So when you're when you're doing and this is maybe my naive understanding of the machine learning side of things, but when you're doing these deep model analysis of like the data that you have, are you essentially like categorizing it so that people can use it or like tagging it? Or For us, there's different level of structuring. So when you think of a recipe, you can think of ingredients and preparation lines. So one type of structuring is to take for example, an ingredient line and extracting certain information from that alone. Like for example, if it says one cup of sugar, you would need to know that sugar is the actual food entity that was in that 
in line and the cup is the amount and one is like, or the unit of measure and one is the amount. So one is structuring, that kind of structuring, and uh, which is kind of annotation, things like that. And the other one is deriving additional labels. So for example, cuisine type or the type of course or things like that. So that's another type of models that, you know, classification models that we have to develop and you're right. Yeah. And there, I mean, there's some other things that we've done that were very interesting that are more on the, the latent semantics space. So for example, on top of this parsing of recipes, you now have a data set where you have co-occurrence of food terms. So Parmesan and tomatoes co-occur quite frequently for some reason. And you can actually build essentially something just like Wertevec. You can build uh, vector representations of these food terms. And the vector representations capture culinary use. So if you look in the vector space for things that are very close to Parmesan, you find all of the other Italian cheeses, Reggiano, et cetera, et cetera. And so by kind of taking this even semi-structured data and then using some of the techniques we all know and love, you can get pretty rich representations that you can then use as good signals or features for other machine learning models that maybe are more. Yeah. For example, ingredient substitutions, you can think about it that way, right? You can think of generative recipes, all sorts of these kind of applications on top of it. Are you doing generative recipes? Uh, I would not say that we've conquered generative recipes. But you're exploring it. But we're exploring it. Yeah, yeah. especially from uh, ingredients. I know for people who, you know, they may have a certain types of ingredients in their house. And That's right. some of these recipes can be exactly. very, like a barrier to entry sometimes with some of the ingredients they ask for. It's nice when you can see what's easy to swap. Yeah, I mean, and there's also very practical things because oftentimes you go to the grocery store and the grocery store themselves don't know what inventory they have. Mm. Yeah. Um, and they may have run out of the thing that you intended to buy, so you need to make a decision in the moment about what to do. Right. And so, okay, once you've got the data set for the food, essentially, and the ingredients and the recipes, I'm guessing there's another side, which is, like, the consumer's wants and needs and, like... How do you mush the two things together? Yeah, that's the personalization step, right? So we, there's kind of two types that Eric mentioned when he sort of described the journey. One is more about like the type of things I like, my taste. I like these types of recipes or I'm following a certain diet, right? And paleo or keto. Diabetes. Um, there's the health conditions that could sort of also dictate certain things. And then there's like... Like that's more on the food domain when you ask people, and then there's more on the shopping domain, right? Which is like, what kind of stores do I like to shop in, and what kind of grocery items do I usually buy? Budget. What my budget is, I have other kind of constraints that may come in, or what do I have in my pantry, and how do I, you know, bring it? Or I dislike these types of like I hate pickles. So if you, you know, if you bring me a recipe with pickles, you're gonna have to some recommend some alternatives to those pickles. So there's all these information. Some of it we, we can ask directly. A lot of other companies do, like very, very directly, right? Like a diet. Are you on a specific diet? Dislikes and likes, things like that. And others, I think we've taken a more different approach. Like, for example, taste for me, people can describe what they like, but it's much easier and maybe much more informative to not ask it directly, but indirectly by asking them to choose a set of recipes from a list or to learn it over time because they're selecting more and more recipes so you can, over time, adapt to their taste better or explore their taste varieties that they like as opposed to asking if you prefer savory or sweet or things like that. The people may say it, but they, they may not always exactly want that one thing. They may want to venture out. So some things we collect very directly by asking and others kind of indirectly through the interaction with the app itself. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. I'm just thinking, like, if you ask me directly what movies I watch, I would probably tell you Art House because I am cultured. But if I'm at home, I'm probably watching Terminator 2. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Or Glow. Yeah. Anyways, no plugging there. Yeah. Um, so, so this is great. It, what are some of the GCP products that you're using? I think it may be easier to say which GCP products we're, we're not, not using. <laughs> yeah, I think. Sure. Yeah. That's a new one. Let's try that. <laughs> what are we not using? Big we're table. not using Big Table. That's about it. Okay. Oh, wow. So you're using, using everything else. Well, we're not using Big Table. We're not using Spanner. Do you use TPUs? Well, why don't we? Yes. Why don't we start? Why don't we start uh, on the journey yeah. where you started, which is like the data side of things. So where, like, where does that data go, and how do you process it? Yes, actually. So the first thing we did build was the crawling system because I'm I'm a data scientist. I've worked with many data scientists. I've never met a data scientist who didn't want more data. 
<laughs> so I figured we better have data if we're going to be successful. So we built a crawling system that's built in Python. The actual operations of it is, is heavily influenced by the availability of things like GKE. That runs on GKE, auto scales on GKE, and all of the data coming out of that is dumped onto GCS, and then all of the post-processing happens uh, via PubSub. Um, so th there's various stages that goes through kind of a, a, a stage pipeline that's all coordinated by, by PubSub, and there are various GKE clusters that read the messages. Uh, and it's also perform. stored on BigQuery even when it's unstructured? Yeah, there's some, there's some, yeah, there's some a whole bunch of side channels that out of this pipeline we, we collect data at various levels of normalization. That is available on GCS in some raw form, which we can then access and we do access via Dataproc. Um, but primarily it ends up in BigQuery and then most of the machine learning either kind of in an ad hoc or in a more formal repeated training way. Are you, are you using Dataproc with more like a Hadoop or with a Spark or? With Spark. Got it. Yeah. Actually, we're, we're increasingly kind of automating a lot of our model training, evaluation, and deployment pipelines on Composer. Tell us about Composer, because I think that's very new. In fact, I have no idea what it is. Composer is it's essentially an orchestration layer. It's, it's hosted Airflow. I mean, Airflow seems to have been widely, increasingly widely used in the industry for doing machine learning pipelines where I have step A, I transform some data. Step B, I maybe need to train a model. You know, next step is maybe I do model evaluation and then model selection, uh, and then I need to deploy it. So if you want to run model training on some schedule like that, we've been doing that recently in, uh, in Composer, and that's worked very well. There's a lot of nice hooks for some of the other GCP offerings, for instance, like Cloud ML Engine. We use a lot of Cloud ML Engine uh, with Keras, actually, in increasingly, and we, we launch our training jobs uh, directly from Composer as we get new data coming in. Uh, new label data or new unstructured data, depending on the pipeline. Yeah, and we do have several models that really are kind of continuous integration development and deployment in the sense that we've developed them, we train them, we get all of that from Composer, and then there's a human in the loop that once the output of the model is shown, we have an internal tool that would show the model output. Internally in our team, we have experts, domain experts, chefs, and, and people in the culinary space that would review the labels of the, uh, that the model produced. For example, like we talked about, it could say that some the type of cuisine or things like that, and they would correct, and we would collect that corrected data, and then we, we can sort of train again the model with more data so that over time the model improves and we can monitor that improvement. So we definitely have kind of those mechanisms. That's still. actually really interesting. So you're not you're not just ML and as you said before you were like we're not just doing a human. It's kind of the combination of both or a little yeah, bit of tweaking. I, I think a lot we, of the companies do that too. Yeah, yeah, I think we even with our experience from our previous company, it's very clear to us that machine learnings and models and I guess that's also my background is like I cannot, in good conscience, have a model that I believe will always be right. There's always going to be cases where a model is going to be wrong. And as Eric said, as a data scientist, I'm always going to want more data. So having experts in the room talking to you, helping you understand the data. And like I would admit, I, I cooked before coming to Elio, but I am not a chef and I am not an expert in this domain. So having the domain experts sit next to me and asking lots of questions about the data so that I understand how to properly utilize it really helps. And so, yeah, we've devised the mechanism so that we can you know, kind of get the most from this domain expert and scale in some sense. When the data is being flowed through your your ETL and, and through the data and doing the training, is it batched? Is it streaming? Is it a mix? It's a mix. It's, it's, yeah, it's a mix. It's primarily batch today, especially in the training side. Uh, I think going forward, it'll be more online and streaming. Um, we do do streaming in another way, which we do apply human to loop, and that is to have human to loop kind of operationally. So. We have a system where a model will be selecting a grocery list, say for an individual, and then the model will also output some confidence scores with respect to the, the rankings it's made in terms of the grocery items. And then if that falls below some threshold, we actually will shunt some of that work to a human expert, and the human expert can review and override some of the model-based decisions. And that's entirely streaming, that process. Yes, yeah, nice. I would say like, we have sufficient data that we don't get a lot from training online, like from every observation. We probably do need you know, enough 
quantity to sort of move the needle again, because the needle is already quite high, so to move it again takes a while. And so I think this system that Eric describes helps us deal with outliers and things that don't work all the way like it should because they're outlier, and, and it will take time for the machine learning to sort of go get all those kind of edge cases. And I'm also curious in terms of your setup, do you, are you using from the more like data engineering side of things, uh, stack driver and other performance tools oh, yeah. to, yeah. 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 to make sure it's yeah. I, it, the system's Eric, functioning the yeah, way you yeah. want when, it to? When Eric said, um, we're, you know, ask us what we're not using, it's actually right. It's probably true. You know, there's a presentation with all the Google icons in them. Yeah. I think we can highlight many, many of the icons that we use. We're really, not just the data science, but also the engineering side, very adventurous and up to date with the current technology that Google is offering so that we can adapt quickly and move fast. And I think we've been really, really good at like, you know, I know a lot of beta, th like Composer and other things that are in pure beta that we are like really adapting already into our stack. I was got, I got excited in this conference to hear more about Cloud Function and, and bringing Python into the mix of it. So I'm eager to test that in our infrastructure. We don't have that yet. But definitely other components from Google have made it very easy as a data scientist to sort of explore data, uh, push models into production. It's been a really nice platform to work with. And you mentioned some of the models that you're working with are recommender well, a lot of these end up being some form of recommendation or classification anyways, but uh, are you, and it sounds like you're using ML Engine, uh, or you said you were using ML Engine, so you're using neural nets then? Some are, to do, yeah, some are like deep learning nets and some are, I like to call them shallow models now that everyone really loves the buzzwords of deep, <laughs> deep models. <laughs> so yeah, we use a combination of shallow and deep model depending on the application, but a lot of it, yeah, we talked about, DNNs. we have like these semantic representation of certain things and then we might train a more shallow model on top of it. Right, so like transfer learn and things like that. So we have a combo of these approaches. Are you using other things like random forests and linear regressions based on the types of other problems that you're working on? Yeah, yeah. yeah most yeah. most yeah. companies it's a, would be. Yeah. It's a combination. I really am not. I'm trained as a statistician, so my I rather be, and I'm practical, so I'm, I'm like, okay, what is the right approach for this problem? And I don't believe that deep learning is the solution to all of the problems in the world. I believe that you know you need to understand the data, you need to understand what you're trying to solve. Sometimes simple approaches can get you what you need in order to solve the, the business problem. It, it tends to be a very layered approach in that like the models that are consuming essentially unstructured data that, that could be raw text, that could be images, for example, tend to be deep neural networks, and then they output some vector representation or, or some additional auxiliary data or labeling that then can be fed into an application-specific model. And sometimes that model is a deep neural network, but very often it's it's not. How are you how are you serving these models? Like how do you end up using them at, at the end? Yeah, we serve them, uh, well, we have a microservices architecture, and so everything, for the most part, ends up in GKE in some form or another. We are starting to increasingly use Cloud ML Engine as a deployment platform when we can. I'm excited to try that with more uh, frameworks than TensorFlow. We've, we've done it with TensorFlow. I'm excited to try that outside of TensorFlow. Because we, we like to think about the models we produce as essentially appliances, and then the engineering organization can just use them as any other service. It's just another API that you call. We're a very small team. We have no platform engineering team. GCP is our platform engineering team. It's, so we, we either have none or we have a giant one, depending on how you look at it. And we have no operations team. Everyone is kind of owns operations, and that includes all the data scientists. So all the machine learning operations online model monitoring, performance monitoring, a stack driver, for example, that's all done by, by, by yeah. Yeah, by, by all, our by data scientists. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's really interesting. And you're using a lot of very different pieces of GCP, but you're you're all owning it with a small team. Are you, are you facing any challenges about like basically using so many things, or are you finding it nice, or how's that experience like? Well, I mean, the you know, some things are kind of new, I think, to, the data science industry in some ways. I mean, most times when we talk to other data scientists, they're not super familiar with Kubernetes, for example. So that's just new. But I think what, what we found is very nice is that the, the abstraction layers at GCP seem to be well considered in that you don't have to relearn 
API primitives or command line interfaces over and over again to use different parts of the system. There's, there's a fair amount of consistency. And so once you know, our, our engineers or data scientists kind of grok the underlying you know, conceptual space, using it tends to be, tends to be pretty, pretty easy. And there's some learning, right, that you need to do in order to ramp up on the different technologies, but I feel like like I never worked on the Google Cloud platform before joining Wellia, and yeah, it took it took a while, but not as much as it took me other platforms. So that's a good a good thing. That's the soundbite. <laughs> Thank you. We're done. Um, <laughs> well, I have two different questions I want to ask. Earlier, before you were saying you want to try to make it accessible outside of TensorFlow, is there a reason why you you want to be able to explore beyond TensorFlow, and is there a specific uh, software that you'd be more interested in? Uh, well, as Savan was saying, our, our quote-unquote shallow models. I love this branding, by the way. I say constantly, shallow and deep. I find it very funny that people once call you, it deep, and now there's no alternative. Yeah, once you go deep, it's hard to <laughs> so say I'm shallow. not doing anything deep. So for our non-deep neural network models, they're primarily scikit-learn. And so to be able to deploy those as uh, individual RESTful interfaces would be would be very useful. Scikit-learn is very popular, yes. Yes, scikit-learn is very popular. I think we could do both of those, and then that allows us also to do model versioning so that we can do A-B testing or canary deployments. Uh, that's something we want to do more of. And it, it provides a safety net so that we can more quickly deploy new models to production, and we don't have to be so careful in terms of the, the testing, but we can deploy, monitor, and then we have the safety to roll back if we need to. And you were saying how it took a little bit of time to get up to speed. Any tips or tricks or advice for those who are exploring GCP for the first time, trying to build out their own solutions for their company? So I was like in a bigger company before. So in a bigger company, data scientists, at least in, in my experience, they really have a very specific role. They don't really do the data engineering that's done by someone else. They're very, very data science, meaning you build, you know, you look at the data, you build a model, and you push it to someone else. And I think my biggest problem was like, oh, I now need to learn all the data engineering side because no one's going to do it for me. Oh, I need to learn DevOps because there's no DevOps team. Oh, I need to do all of these things. So it was more tackling those things. I think from a data science perspective, like if my role in this company was just look at data, develop models, and push it, this platform makes it extremely easy to do those tasks. Really, like accessing the data in different formats from different locations has become extremely easy and simple simple, spinning up your own notebooks to be able to explore the data from different places is very easy. Deploying the model now becomes extremely easy too with CloudML. So it's a platform that's designed in some sense for a data scientist to play around with. I think it becomes more challenging when you're like, yeah, you, oh, you're also the engineer and the DevOps, so you need to learn about Kubernetes and you need, oh yeah, you do need to understand all these things. Then it becomes a little bit more complicated. You also mentioned earlier that you are using TPUs. How are you using TPUs? For training purposes. Yeah, well, one thing that's very important for us is to think about our biggest cost, and our biggest cost is opportunity cost, in that we, we don't have an infinite number of software engineers, so if a software engineer is doing X, they're not doing Y. And that means, especially for people building and building models, that the faster they can get to the next iteration result, the better. So that is reducing training time, and we use accelerators and TPUs and GPUs for, for reducing time to answer. And the other thing that we uh, increasingly use, which has been very beneficial for us, is the hyperparameter optimization. Yeah. So it used to be that we would have these long discussions, uh, you know. That's true. People thought that their job as a data scientist was to know and have intuition about which hyperparameters to choose. And now I tell them, you know, don't really worry about that. We'll just run a big experiment. And I'd rather have the experiment running than, than spend another couple of days thinking about which parameters should be used. What's the issue there for people who aren't familiar with that space? When you build, say, take a deep neural network, um, you have to decide how many layers you should have, how many, how big each layer should be, which which units you have in each layer. You could choose from different units. Activation functions. Yeah, I mean, there's, yeah. a, there's just a smorgasbord of. It's like a, the way I like to explain it, and I'm just going to jump in with this, is it's almost like you have one of those very complex, you know, radios that you can tune all the things for the radio to make the sound sound like a certain quality. But you got to be an expert on how to tune it, and that can be a challenge. Yeah, that can be a challenge, and the alternative to be an expert is, yeah, you know, let the machine worry about that, because then you can go on to doing things that I, I think are higher value, which is, well, what problem should we be solving? 
what should we work should we prioritize, which new model should we build, and, and let the platform do the fine tuning. I think we've seen the same thing, by the way, with feature engineering. And I've had discussions with data scientists, even Googlers data scientists, who, who told me that they, they think their job is getting automated away because their job used to be to look at some raw data and then they could figure out how to encode the raw data in these features that would work yeah. well in a machine learned model. And now with deep neural networks, the network does most of the encoding and it does a better job of encoding the raw input than most data scientists do so that the data scientist's job is no longer to be a feature engineer. And I think the next phase is the data scientist's job is not going to be to be choosing hyperparameters and then it's probably going to be not to be choosing uh, model architectures. Well, and that starts to touch into AutoML too, which have you explored that yet? A little. Yes, that, that's on the list of things we ha have used. Yeah. <laughs> we've done one, like we tried once or twice. There might be good use cases for it, and I agree that some automation is good, but maybe like my own internal thing is like I want to see the model. I need to see the actual like architecture and what it does. And I believe in the technology of deep learning. I understand it mathematically, I understand where it's going, but I also like believe that the value of a data scientist is in interpreting some of these things sometimes. And the more deep learning is applied, the less people have an understanding. Even the people who actually develop these models have a less understanding of what's going on internally, what are the actual features it's creating, how to like explain it to anyone, the causal things that people like to interpret with causality becomes really hard. So. I think with AutoML, it's even more obscure than normal. I see a lot of benefit for certain places, especially if you want to accelerate certain things that are very common tasks in machine learning, then you should use it because there's, you don't need to hire today like a whole suite of data scientists just to build a model that every, like, that's already kind of implemented for you. Right. And it takes away that magic of like feature selection and all of these things. So I think it's very useful for those kind of use cases. I feel like if you have a data scientist and they know what they're doing, letting them play around with TensorFlow and building models that you can better grasp when they fail and when they're good. It's good for the organization. So this is why I guess Eric and I are a good pairing is uh, he pushes in that direction and I push in the other direction. So on average, it's, it's fine. Excellent. Well, and one other thing on the TPU side, do you combine those with GPUs and CPUs and, and the calculations and the computations that you're doing? Yeah, that's one thing that I would say is still a challenge for us, which is when you have a particular model training job, having to decide the compute infrastructure. Because sometimes it's actually, uh, especially in dollar terms, um, that, that requires a lot of trial and error on our part. I'd love to be able to just set a budget. I would like to train this model for this many dollars and be able to trade off time to conversions and dollars. Ooh, sounds like a good product to build. Yeah. Um, because a forecaster. Yeah, because what we do now is we will run a job and we'll use just CPU, distributed CPU training, and then we'll compare that with a single GPU, and then you can choose your flavors of GPUs or, or TPU, and then we have to decide for that class of models which one we think we should use uh, as the standard in our composer workflow, which is doing the automated training. That's a very like operational like, optimization decision that, that most, I think, most data scientists probably don't want to do. But like I've seen talks in, in this conference talk a lot about the engineering costs, and they less focus about these topics of like, oh, how, how much does it take to train your model? It's more about if you have an app, where should you deploy it, and how much it will cost you, or like operationally what's going on. And I think this, this is kind of an area that hasn't yet been fully explored, maybe. Well, and off that point, what have you seen next that you've been excited about or that you're interested in looking into further? We actually, we made a list yes. just before coming here without knowing that this is going to be a question. <laughs> and there were quite a few things. So I got really excited about cloud functions. I can see immediate benefits and I like that there's a Python beta version. So I'm like, okay, we, we might want to try that. We might want to venture into that. There's some Google Vision that we looked at that we were like, oh, we might be able to capitalize on it. There's some really cool new things that were shown there. I actually went to an amazing talk that maybe is not new, but just explained it in a better like, way. It was like a DevOps advocator, but uh, she was one of the keynote speakers today. Uh, her was name's it Aja? Aja. Aja's great. She She's gave a talk team. yesterday with kind of tips for DevOps for people who are not DevOps. 
and I would like it's going to be on YouTube. I heard, so we'll I highly recommend that one. It was a very, very good talk, and so I'm excited to take some of the learnings she suggested there. I was telling Eric there was a talk about Traffic Director. We Googled it and couldn't find it. So there's an alpha version of something called Traffic cool. Director. It's yo and and it works well with Envoy. So all of these things were like, oh, those are interesting things we should start thinking about. And then the last one was the Firestore stuff that were mentioned throughout. Lots of things here in Next we're talking about Firestore. So I thought there's some nifty ideas on how you kind of immediately go from Firestore into BigQuery and other kind of storages so that the data can, can, can get shown more uh, quickly to the data scientist and to the models. So I'm kind of excited about that right. too. So lots of things. Anything on your end or is that the entire list? I mean, <laughs> it was a, good, no, it was a great it's pretty, list. It's pretty similar. I, I mean, I think we're increasingly as a business providing our platform to partners. And that means giving them access to APIs and that creates kind of additional operational needs. So I'm really excited about Istio. Uh, in terms of talks and kind of ways to use Kubernetes well, the developer keynote, Kelsey Hightower's talk was pretty awesome. This I actually there. had the chance to, a few weeks ago, serendipitously pair program with him at the end of dinner yes. for 15 minutes. And I can say that the talk is exactly like the pair programming experience. <laughs> so so I, I, I'm excited to be able to use more of the operational elements, things like Istio and Spinnaker, I kind of really extend uh, GKE as an operations platform and be able to do less operations, especially as we do B2B integrations. Fantastic. Well, before we wrap up today, is there anything we've missed or anything you want to make sure that our listeners know about? Are you hiring? Only eat dark chocolate above a certain percent, otherwise the experience is very bad. <laughs> and don't eat 100% because that's also a very bad experience. <laughs> That's one very important tip. We are hiring. We're looking for backend engineering slash data engineering to join my team. So definitely that. We also have yeah, a we're hiring in all kinds of roles. Senior yeah. application developer. So definitely people on that spectrum. And I think if you're generally interested in the food tech space, it would be great to get in touch with us. I'm going to assume the email is going to be somewhere yeah. visible. And so we'd be always happy to, to talk to people who are passionate about this space and have opinions, even if they're not technology kind of people. That's totally nice. fine, too. Well, thank you both for joining. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So thanks again to Sivan and Eric for joining us on the podcast. This was a great episode. Uh, so glad that you had the time to sit down with us at Next and really share your knowledge with how Wellio is built. It was really awesome. Agreed. And I think that wraps it up for our, our next interviews finally. So thank you for being our last, but definitely not the least episode to be able to share with everyone. Okay, Mark, let's talk about Inbox. Inbox is going to be going away in the next six months is my understanding. And so there's been a lot of work to make sure some of the features and functionality that Inbox has has been moved over to Gmail. So what does that look like? Yeah, so that's a good question. So first, Melanie, are you an Inbox user? I have been. I am definitely an Inbox user. How do you feel? I... Um... I'm okay. I'm okay. You're okay. <laughs> I'm okay. Most of everything's been moved across. The only feature that, that I would like to see move across, um, if anyone's listening, I would love to see bundles move across. If that happens, then I'm fine. They do say that there's some more additional features they're working on bringing over. But I, I agree that in Inbox, the snooze feature was my favorite. And so when that came into Gmail, yep. part, it made it easier for me to, to start adopting Gmail again. Yeah, so definitely, uh, yeah, Inbox Inbox is my life. Inbox is my to-do list. So there is, yes, March 2019, Inbox is being shut down. It was a wonderful experiment. Uh, and so... They're moving a lot of the features over, which is really good. And a lot of the features have been moved over as well. Uh, there is a transition guide that has been written. So if you're looking for like snoozing of emails, yep, we can do that, which is really good because yeah, snoozing is the best. You can work offline. Yeah, you can do stuff offline, which is awesome too. Though I do particularly appreciate coming back to Gmail, the new smart replies. I really like that. So yes, we've got a transition guide that we're going to link for everyone to see what types of features have been brought over to Gmail. So you can have an understanding of how that will look, how that will work. Yeah, and pretty much everything has been moved over, right? Like reminders, if you use those, which I do, moving over to Google Tasks is pretty seamless. So you just yes. need to move that stuff across, which is pretty good. Like Snooze is still there. You can replicate bundles with using tags and, and filters. So it's not, it's not the end of the world. It's not the end of the world. I'm okay. It is not the end of the world. And we highly recommend everyone, if you are using Inbox, to start taking a look at Gmail again and see how that is transformed. Yeah, you might actually not recognize it because it did go through a big redesign a little while ago. Yeah. And there's a lot of really cool features in there. 
All right, Mark, where are you going to be? What you up to? Uh, you and I are going to be in Strange Loop. In, in we are uh, in basically on the day this comes out. I think I'm flying in later than you are. Yes, I know you're a little bummed because you're missing out on the the museum party that they do every year. Yeah, apparently people want to meet me and talk to me about stuff. So yes, I will be. I will be late. I am a little sad. But why are you going to be late? Um, basically, internal games meeting stuff is, is basically the reason. I'm chairing our internal game summit. That's fun. Yeah, it's good. It's going to be awesome. It is going to be awesome. And Strangelove will be really wonderful, too. And we're planning on recording a podcast there that we will share soon. So you'll hear more about that later. And Mark, anywhere else you're going to be in the next month? I don't think so. I think October is going to be relatively quiet. There is a chance that I will be at Unite LA. That's probably where I will be. I have no idea what I'm doing there or what I'm doing, but it seems likely that I'll probably be at Unite LA. Are you going anywhere? I am. I'm going to be in Portland, Maine the week after Strange Loop. I'm going to be speaking at Monktoberfest. Oh, cool. Yeah, should be fun. All right, Mark, I think that's it for us for this week. I think so too. So, Melanie, thank you so much for joining me for yet another episode of the podcast. Thank you. And thank you all for listening, and we'll see you all next week. 